access and quality. And this is the problem of education in the world, right? Pe poor people don't have access to school. Is that a problem in some parts of Ethiopia, some parts of India, some parts of Brazil? Some, it, that's a problem of access, right? And what happens when the air, there is access to schools in Rwanda? Poor quality. And why is quality so difficult to deliver in education? It costs a lot of money. There is a huge difference between education and good education. Most poor people in the world actually have access to schools, contrary to what happened 30 years ago. But the quality sucks bad, to the point that the poor people tell their daughter, leave school, honey. There's no future there. So, this is a problem, right? Microfinance addressed this issue because it provides access to funding and the quality is very high. What makes a microfinance loan a high quality financial instrument? It is small. It is actually $30. That is a high quality product, okay? Huh? It is, I will give you a loan. It doesn't require your collateral. It doesn't require for you to need uh, to have a balance sheet. It is a, a, the type, the exact type of loan at the exact time in the currency that the lady in French camp needs to buy flour for her tortilla business, right? high quality. What is the repayment rate of microfinance loans? Low or high? Why? Because of hope, because of dignity, and because of the quality of the product. So microfinance works as the ultimate social entrepreneurship. And we are very lucky to have Jerry Hildebrand, the director of the school who has worked with microfinance in Latin America for many, many years. The ultimate social entrepreneurship. Take business skills and apply them to social problems where social impact and not profit is the objective. Of course, you cannot have social impact and be bankrupt. So you have to have a double bottom line. So. If it works in microfinance, and it is not about finance, but it is about dignity, can it work with education? We are seeing, what if a school would train 100% employable graduates, and it was 100% free, and it was 100% education that pays for itself. What would happen if, uh, if schools were free for the poor, high quality, and it was free? So this is what we're trying to come up with. And we have developed a model of a self-sufficient rural school in Paraguay. And our school generates $300,000 a year through classes. Is that possible? Amazing. You have a yogurt class, and the yogurt class, this is how you prepare yogurt, and this is how you prepare cheese, and then the class manufactures yogurt, sells them in the supermarket, and with a profit of the cheese, pays the professor. High quality education covers all of them. Do you think it's applicable for Ethiopia? Yes. For Brazil? Yes. For India? Yes. For a slum in Philadelphia? 
Stockton. So, this is what we were doing, and one day I get an email. Hi, my name is Nick Kafka. I work in the financial district in London, and I would like to go and visit your microfinance operation in Paraguay. And I said, sure, come along. So I'd like to introduce you, Nick Kafka, who has been part of this amazing adventure. And he can tell you the other yang. We're like the yin and yang of, the, of this story. Well, uh, thanks for turning up this evening, and uh, thanks, Jerry, for uh, inviting me over. It's uh, a real pleasure to kind of be here. I've been hearing stories uh, about the UOP ever since I first met Martin, and, uh, you know, his, he can start with a, a love story. Uh, you know, I, I haven't got something quite as dramatic for you, although the, my, my own progeny is sort of sitting in the back row. There, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't know. The, the one thing that struck me from what Martin was saying about you know, his path into social entrepreneurship is that, you know, none of this is a, a straight line and you come here and you're studying one thing today and you think you know where you're going to go, but you really can't, you know, know, know for sure where you're going to end up. And sometimes the most interesting things happen when you kind of keep your mind a little bit open and you can then decide later where you want to go. So, uh, yeah, I started off just as a, you know, studying chemistry at university and almost knowing that that wasn't really where I wanted to end up but uh, looking for the right opportunity, and that didn't come along straight away, and I went into finance. But you know, looking back at it all now, it's amazing how all these things add up to where you are, and I couldn't be where I am now if I hadn't have done that. Um, so yeah, you know, not, not everyone's going to leave university and go off and save the world straight away. And maybe that isn't actually the best thing to do, because it's really useful and really important for this whole kind of social entrepreneurship sector that people come in with skills that are commercial skills that are developed in a kind of business-like environment because possibly over the years too many non-profits have kind of just concentrated on the good they wanted to achieve and not really focused enough on how they could actually achieve more of it if only they took a you know a slightly more entrepreneurial approach so um so yeah i, I went from chemistry off, off, off into finance and was there sort of sitting in my bank one day sort of playing around in google because it was uh, a bit of a quiet time and uh, up popped something uh, about the fundation and their microfinance program i thought well you know you've done finance maybe it makes sense to kind of go and do microfinance which is just more like banking for the poor so uh i batted off the mail and uh, i guess you know it's just a testament to people who are really open to the opportunities that are out there that you know, Martin replied, you know, I sometimes feel a bit guilty at some of the uh, emails in my own inbox that never quite get replied to, because, you know, e every one of you could be batting off those emails and every one of you could be doing amazing things if you just got those opportunities. Um, but yeah, Martin replied, I hopped on a plane, went, went off to Paraguay, was just kind of blown up, you know, picked up at the airport, thought, right, I'm going to go and do microfinance, I'm going to go and do microfinance, and Martin just drove me down to... Uh, to his school and said, you know, before you uh, think about that, we've just taken over this school and we don't know how we're really going to pay for it, but we know that we can't run a school, but we don't want to let it go bust. So, so what are we going to do? We can, we can somehow make it pay for itself. It's like taking these ideas of sustainability that make microfinance work, that help it to reach huge numbers of people, and making it work in education. Uh, and I thought from that, you know, microfinance was pretty worked out even at that kind of stage, which was about six years ago. But this was something no one else was ever kind of doing before. So I thought, you know, hang it, you know, you come from finance, let's do education, which uh, was, you know, a huge shift, but, but in many ways, just part of this, you know, entrepreneurship thing of staying open to opportunities and, and seeing something that came along. So uh, I was there right at the start when they uh, were working on, on this school and trying to figure out exactly how, how to make it pay for itself. As Martin explained, it's kind of, they just run these 16 school businesses and each of the school businesses trains the students, teaches them a, a huge amount, but also has profit centers and they create their yogurt and they create their, um, uh, the, there's a shop, there's a hotel, they produce cheeses of various sorts, dulce de leche, all, all sorts of things. And, and all of these are areas where the students themselves 